I'm Brendan Woods, public defender of Alameda County. And this episode of Air Hustle contains explicit language. Please be advised, this may not be for every listener. They told me I was limited, huh? Limited to reach my dreams. They told me I was limited, huh? I couldn't add a finer things. And mama, please don't cry. Why? Cause I survived through the jungle, I'm a king. My eyes always on the prize, huh? I hit success despite the things that I've seen. You're now tuned in to San Quentin's Ear Hustle from PRX's Radiotopia. I'm Nigel Poor, a visual artist, now podcaster. I've been working with the guys in San Quentin State Prison in California for about eight years. And I'm Rasan New York Thomas, a resident of San Quentin serving a life sentence for second degree murder. And together, we're going to take you inside and out. On this episode, we're talking about getting out. Hitting the streets, kissing the concrete. What it's like to leave prison and start a new life. Freedom! (laughs) So, New York. What's up, Nod? I am guessing listeners are wondering... Where's our co-host? I'm right here. I'm right in front of you, Naj. <laughs> I am right in front of you. Yes, yes, you are. But I'm talking about the other co-host, that guy on the outside, Erlon. Oh, yeah, Erlon. Erlon's going to pop up a little bit later in the podcast, but right now, I have the mic. Yes, you do. And that's because we're inside San Quentin right now. And Erlon's out on the street talking to guys about life post-incarceration. New York, you know something about that because you've actually gotten out of prison before. Yep, back in 1991. And what were you concerned about back then? Where would I work? Where would I live? Would the streets forgive me? Would I get my girl back? Oh, there's so much stuff. Absolutely. And everybody going home faces all these same challenges, sometimes even more. We recently talked with two guys who were getting ready to go home. My name is Tevin Fortnette, a.k.a. Cuddy. Tuesday, um, I'm getting released from San Quentin State Prison after seven and a half years, and uh, I'm looking forward to this. I'm tired. <laughs> they didn't whip me. They didn't whip my 20s. I'm, I'm tired. Let's go, let's go. Eight, three. Cuddy is 28 years old. He's just finishing a sentence for robbery and home invasion. He's got long, thin dreads. He's about six foot three, and he's known in San Quentin for his basketball skills. Yeah, Cuddy is raw. He's the starting forward for the San Quentin Warriors. And does he have one of those basketball nicknames? Yeah, they call him Swaggy Smooth because he has a nice 12-foot jumper. That is a fun name to say. <laughs> Swaggy Smooth. And you know what else? I hear he's a pretty good rapper. Yes, he is. We heard him at the top of the podcast. Guess life ain't what I thought it'd be, so I smoke to take all my pain away, so understand me when I say pardon me. My cousin died from mental When we interviewed Cuddy, he was really, I mean, really excited about getting out. Lately at night, I've been just thinking about, like, next week, I'm going to be home. Like, damn, I want to go to sleep, but now nah, i got to study this DMV book. Oh, i got to go to sleep, but nah, i got to plot out some more stuff that I want to do. i got to keep adding to the bucket list. i got to keep adding to fragrances that I want to wear, st- everything. Because now I'm free, so, you know, it's like I get to do whatever I want to do. The first day, he had his whole script down pat. Belgian waffles with, with whipped cream on top, sliced strawberries, and uh, strawberry syrup. I need it. With a side of orange juice, I need that. I ain't had that since I was like 18. And Cuddy was not planning on eating those waffles alone. No, he wasn't, because Cuddy got married when he was in prison. This is my first time actually on the streets as a husband. This is actually my first time just going on a date, breakfast date or something. So it's gonna be like, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I'm juiced about that. Okay, so the first day, Waffles with his wife. Second day, that's all business. That's when I go get my license, my uh, social security card. I go register for school. I go register for the union. I got everything just set up. Now, the third day, I really want to hit the studio or something. That's what my my goal is. I got to go work out, so I got to go hit the gym. I got to go hoop. So Cuddy's got his first days on the outside all mapped out. 
Absolutely. That's what guys in prison think about a lot. No doubt. Yeah, we want to think about who we're going to hang out with, who's going to be meeting us out there, what, what we're going to eat, eat. Yeah, yes. what we're going to wear, mm, everything. All that good stuff. So, Naj, me and co-producer Yaya went out to the yard to find out what guys out there would say they were going to do when they get out. I want to go parasailing. Oh, I would love to get my niece and we go to an amusement park. Hug my mom, hug my dad, and probably ball out crying for a little while. Just let it all out. Get my wife over here from England, massage her throat with my tongue. <laughs> I'm going to take my girl and my grandkids up to a place called Usaw and I go camping for a whole week. Hear the crickets chirping and the frogs croaking. And I want to take all my boys, man, that I grew up with to the paintball range. Wet t-shirt contest, dancing contest. I'm actually wanting to go see the symphony. I've never experienced any classical music and I want to go experience that. I really want to go see the uh, point of no return in Africa. The, the caves the, where they, the slaves right before they was put on the boat. And get a sense of what that was like. I want to go uh, to my mother and father's uh, grave and take them flowers. Let them know that I'm out and I love them and I miss them. What are the three things that you're looking forward to the most after you get out? Okay, three things I'm looking forward to. This is Ronnie Young. We spoke to him right before he left the queue. Showering alone. <laughs> and not standing in line for the shower or going to brush your teeth and having to smell someone else on the toilet. Oh, my God, that's so huge. <laughs> um, being able to open a refrigerator door and grab a pickle or something to drink. <laughs> Ice cream. And then I got to have milk on ice cream. What flavor? <laughs> oh, God, it doesn't even matter to me. I, I, I just love ice cream. So what are, you, what are your concerns? Think, I mean, I, when, when we asked you what's happening tomorrow, I could see your face got really excited. But I can also see there's a part of you that's wearing something heavy. Because I don't know what I'm going to do. When we spoke with Ronnie, he was finishing up a three-year sentence, but this was his sixth time being locked up. The longest Ronnie has ever stayed out of prison has been two years. How old were you the first time you came to prison? Ooh, 22. And how old are you now? Uh, I'm 50. So I can just ask you a blatant question. Why do you keep coming back to prison? Drugs. Every time I get out of prison, I go right back to selling drugs and using drugs. And what's your drug of choice? Methamphetamine. So where are you with your addiction right now? I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I want to say uh, it's behind me, but it's not. It's, I mean, it's right in my face. How long have you been clean? Oh, honestly, a couple months. So clearly... Ronnie was using inside. The meth really had a hold on him. And I hate it. I, I, I hate Crystal. I hate the people that comes along with the Crystal. They're untrustworthy. <laughs> and that's crazy because those are the people I've surrounded myself with all my life, but I can't stand them. And, and I used to always think, man, I'm not a bad person. But in reality, I, I, I wouldn't want me running around my neighborhood. I've gotten out of prison and told people in my town, out of respect, please don't sell none of that shit to my kid. And them tell me, oh, yeah, don't, don't worry, I won't. And then I find out they still are. But I was doing the same thing. But I never stopped and thought of that until I got out of prison and saw my own son using and him on dialysis. So drugs were killing him. And then I said I would never sell drugs again. And then I got out last time and was living in my daughter's home. 
and not working and feeling about that big because my daughter's supporting me, instead of going out and getting a job, I started selling drugs again and thought everything was good, but I just compounded things and made them a hundred times worse. Ronnie's son and daughter are deceased. They both had a rare genetic disorder, cystinosis. And in the case of his son, drugs may have hastened his death. Ronnie's mom lives in Alabama. And he has a grandson, too. It's his daughter's son. And after years of going back and forth to prison, his family dynamics are all messed up. I don't know where I'm going to go. I mean, I may have to go check into a drug program. Because I, because I literally have no place to go. And I don't know, because I've spent so much time in prison. Um, you get out there and, and everything is like overwhelming. The prison is right there to my right. And I'm looking down at the water. Uh, a few seagulls in the water flying around. Uh, it's coming up. And it got like a little itty bitty wave that had come up. Watch this, you probably hear it like, let's see, right now, watch this. Oh, that sounded so nice. Hey, E. What up, Notch? So you went to the gates of San Quentin to meet Ronnie and Cuddy. Okay, here you go. Yep, and I was there waiting on Cuddy, along with his wife, Lisa, mm-hmm. and a former friend of San Quentin and a former friend of Ear Hustle, yep. Jason Jones. LB. Which is Cuddy's partner. Here he come. I told you. Most guys come out with boxes, appliances, and all kind of shit. Not Cuddy. I travel light. I travel light. Lisa jumped into his arms. Jason gave him a big hug. Mm-hmm. And then he came and hollered at me. What's up, dog? What's up with you, sir? How you doing? Oh, man, you look good, man. Hey, man, out here just having fun, man. Oh, man. You know I girl. have to know what he was wearing. <laughs> so Cuddy had there, on a navy blue sweatsuit and some black Nike Air Max 95s. Mm. I wouldn't have knew that unless he told me. What did that feel like when you put them on? Oh, man, I was back. I was back. And, and all I can do is dust myself off. And, and it a different feeling than the khaki yeah. prison did shit. That, did them them uh, pajamas they give us in there? Yeah. For sure, for sure. The cotton was soft. The, <laughs> I felt everything. Shoes oh, yeah. felt good. Socks. Oh, yeah, it's good. How you feel right now, man? I'm ecstatic. I can't even. <laughs> that was kind of low. He's like, I'm ecstatic. Yeah, I'm ecstatic. Because I'm trying to control it. Like, I feel like jumping and running down the, st- down the thing hey, right now. Hey, <laughs> Stay in the, I'm so you, like, you gonna do some sprints? They don't know. I'm, do some, I'm telling you, do some I run back and forth right now, but it's like <laughs> I'm just trying to control it. All right, man. You know, Nige, mm-hmm. there was one more box he had to check. What was that? He and his wife had to hurry up over to Oakland mm-hmm. to check in with his parole office about 10 a.m. Man, so no waffles? No waffles. Mm-hmm. He had to meet his parole officer and sign his conditions of parole. Mm-hmm. So I caught up with him in the parking lot just as he was walking out. Conditions is victims, association, and court imposed. I got him to read the conditions of his parole. Wait, explain that. It's the things that he can do while he's on parole and the things that he can't do. Letters, anything. And the third is the association with my crime partners. That's it. That's it. You know, one thing that wasn't on his conditions of parole? What's that? Fire, drove, trees, edibles, hmm. piva. <laughs> mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Cuddy's crime had nothing to do with drugs, right. so not smoking weed was not one of his conditions of parole. And also, it's perfectly legal in California. Well, it is. I mean, I didn't see. All I seen was a roll blunt and a lighter mm-hmm. and his car rolling out of the parking lot with Lisa at the wheel. They must have been really ready for those waffles. Yep, after smoking up an appetite. We'll be right back after the break. I was just wondering, you gonna swim right back? How you doing, man? Okay. Good, you? I'm chilling, man. I'm kicking back. I got you. I feel. I got you. Wonderful. A few days later, I went back to San Quentin to meet Ronnie Young as he stepped off that white van. What are you noticing out here? No cops. <laughs> <laughs> and a crow. Yeah, freedom. 
<laughs> yeah, real job, real job. Let's go swimming. Yeah. Huh? It's water. They probably get mad though, huh? Thinking we were trying to escape or something. Okay, he sounds a lot better than when we talked to him inside. Well, it's finally real when you step off that van, yeah. you know. It's your first moments of freedom. And his friend Tammy was there to meet him, to take him back to Stockton where he's from. Okay. But first, we went to get something to eat. Of course. Then Ronnie wanted to go sell some flowers. The roses. So in San Quentin, tons of guys do these really beautiful crafty projects and Ronnie made these roses out of soap shavings and they're actually really colorful and beautiful and smell good and smell good because he either put perfume on them or he, he used scented, scented soap. soap yeah scented yeah. soap and someone in San Quentin had told him he can go to Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco and sell them excuse me buy your lady a rose he was carrying a bunch of roses in a cardboard box and he was wearing the khakis button down shirt and sweatshirt his friend Tammy had sent him to wear his first day out. That sounds professional. And Nige, I gotta say, he looks a lot like a certain fictional TV character mm -hmm. who also has a history with methamphetamine. Walter White from Breaking Bad. Yep. And E, the resemblance is uncanny. And if you know the show, it's something you cannot help but notice about him. And he doesn't seem to mind either. Mm -mm. I mean, he even got a big-ass picture of Walter White pasted on a notebook that he carries around. He does. Excuse me, are you guys from here? Hi. How are you? Oh, that's it? You don't want to talk, huh? All right. I don't know what to say to these people. <laughs> I'm getting nervous. After getting shot down at least six times, Runny approached a young couple. He was a little rusty. Excuse me. You have a minute? Where are you from? Are you from here? No. Where are you from? Mexico. So have you heard of San Quentin? San Juan? San Quentin? The state prison? No. No? no. So look, I, I I make these out of soap, right? And this, this right here is that they run a newspaper inside the prison. And so I rolled up the, the newspapers and, and made stems out of them. Are you interested in a rose for your lady? <laughs> How much is worth a rose? Twenty dollars. What? <laughs> Twenty bucks? Hey, look, he was thinking he was selling them for too cheap. Oh boy. Because yeah. he said, hey man, it's too much work for just 20 bucks. I know, I hear that, but asking for 20 bucks on the streets a lot. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank yes, you. Sir. Huh? So let's talk about that. Your first deal of your freedom got you a $20 bill. Yeah. You made some couple happy. Right? Yeah. Some couple from Mexico. From Mexico. You guys want to go? And that was it. One sale and Ronnie was ready to move on. Uh, Mom, this is my phone number. You can call me. I'm out of prison, so call me. Okay, bye. I love you, bye. We drove him to a hotel where he was going to meet his friend Tammy, and he started thinking aloud about who in his past he wanted to reconnect with. I really want to see the mother of my kids and my grandson. I haven't been with the mother of my kids in a long time, like since my daughter was born. And my, my daughter was 28 when she passed away. We dropped yeah, Ronnie in Richmond with Tammy, and she drove him to Stockton that same day. Please leave your message for... And five, then nine, I lost contact one, four, for two three. weeks. Mm. Hey, what's up, Ronnie? This is Erline Woods. Um, Finally, we got a text from him that said, I just want to let you know that I apologize for the way I acted. So what was he sorry for, actually? Shit, he ghosted on us. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he stopped calling. Anyhow, I drove to Stockton to see him. I met him at the bus station. It was windy, so we sat in the car and talked, and we got right to it. So since the time we left you, what have you been going through? Uh, well, I've already been using. Look, I'm at the, at the bus station. Mm-hmm. And some dude comes up and, and he's going, hey, Ronnie, hey, Ronnie. And I don't even know the dude, right? And he knew your name and shit? Yeah. 
because I used to sell him shit, right? Oh, yeah, okay. And there it went. And, uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, it was all bad. Mm. Do it make you feel better? No, absolutely not. It makes me feel worse. As soon as I got high, I, I don't even want to be around nobody because I certainly don't want people knowing. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, fuck, that's what's kept me in prison all my life, man, is drugs. I hate it, bro. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sleeping on the streets. One night I slept, I, I went, <laughs> check this out. One night I went into the police department to their lobby, curled my ass up on the floor and went to sleep. It was it, it was the safest spot, huh? Right. <laughs> it, nobody nobody gave me nobody bothered me, but uh, it, at Target in Manteca, they they got them big huge ass dumpsters, and that's where I slept the other night. Was it cold or something? And it was like, man, that's the best spot. Well, it was I mean, because there was a bunch of cardboard in there. You know what I mean? So it was the cleanest spot, probably. <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't understand why they don't just put me in a program, man. Put me in a program. Erlon, can you explain why Ronnie is not in a program? I mean, if anyone should be in a substance abuse program, it's Ronnie. So it's complicated. Ronnie is on probation and not parole. Right. So most people that get out on parole you have to have your plans lined up for what you're gonna do, where you're gonna live, where you're gonna work. If you have to go through drug treatments or alcohol treatment programs, you got to have them in place on the outside because mm -hmm. you're gonna need that. Mm -hmm. It's all sorts of things. But people on probation like Ronnie don't need the plans like that before they get out. Okay, so Ronnie walked out of the gates with a lot less lined up. Exactly. Another thing is that parole is a state program, Okay. but probation is ran by the counties. Some counties will put a lot of effort behind getting folks connected with rehab and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And for other counties, including the one Runny's in, that's less a priority. But I heard the county actually offered him housing. So why didn't he take it? I mean, he had no place of his own. At the time, he told me that he didn't want to live around other addicts. That's a trigger for him. Okay. Sometimes he stays in a hotel room Tammy pays for. Okay. But he doesn't want to break her bank, so he's been spending time on the streets. In any case, he wanted to go to Manteca, his hometown, about 20 minutes from Stockton. Mm -hmm. So I drove him, and we continued to talk. What do you feel was one of the lowest points being out here on the streets? Oh, man, I don't know. Um, just walking and, and having no place to go, like... I mean, nowhere to go. Unless I want to get deep up in it again, you know? And I don't, bro. And as we were driving, we passed places he knows all too well. Right out here, French Camp Road, right? Uh-huh. Homeboy, I was out here walking. Yeah? Look, I was, I was in this orchard right here, right? Uh-huh. But then over here, you, you, you got, uh, a cemetery, right? Uh huh. That's where my kids were cremated. But man, I was just walking around out here, bro. Nothing to do, nowhere to go. He'd been out of prison two weeks and freedom was taking his toll. I mean, he looked all right, but clearly he was hurting. Yeah. Uh, at one point, he wanted to show me something. Look at this. And he took off his shoes. Look at, and that's just from walking. Look at the purple. And and you're showing your feet, and that's just from walking. Yeah. Mm. You know, Erlon, hearing that makes me think about something I asked Ronnie the day before he left San Quentin. I got to ask you a really hard question. I'm okay. sorry. Are you better off staying in prison than getting out? No. Can you talk about that? Who we? God, I don't even like that. 
Uh, and I'm not a, I'm not judging you, and I'm not all saying that that's that you should stay in prison, but in prison, you have food, you have a place to sleep, you have the possibility of programs. So that's why I'm asking you. Are you better off in prison where you have all of these things, or is prison so horrible? Doesn't matter. I want to be outside. Prison is horrible. There's no part of you that would stay here. No, absolutely not. No. I, I, I hate it here. Erlon, what about Cuddy? How's he doing? Cuddy is doing good. A few days after his release, his mom's had a party for him. He'd been nervous the whole time about being around so many people. But as soon as that day came, he was out there getting his groove on. I'm, I'm up, everybody dancing. Oh, man, it feel good. I'm just feeling the energy and the love. It's, it's good. I'm, I'm, I'm having fun. That's what I am. Nice. He and his wife are cool. Mm -hmm. He's been reconnecting with his son, playing basketball. Oh, that's great. He's also got a job working in HVAC. Mm -hmm. And like he said he would back when he was in San Quentin, he managed to get into the studio and lay some tracks down. You hear me? Huh? This shit forsaken to me. Devil been racing for me. Patience is a virtue, but they never had patience for me. Niggas wish you well, but it's not what they make it to be. Lord said if I blessed them blessings, they couldn't take them from thee. That's real life. So, E, we've heard about the first few weeks of two very different guys just out of prison. Right. And I know it's just two guys, but what do you think it says about life post-incarceration? Well, I think it's important to plan ahead. Yep. I mean, some guys spend years planning for the day they get out like arranging jobs, places to live, programs to involve yourself in. Mm -hmm. And Cuddy did all that. Yep. But Runny didn't have a plan. He didn't seem to think too far beyond going to Fisherman Wharf and selling some flowers. Yeah, he didn't have much support. He did have Tammy, but Cuddy had his mother, his wife, his friends, and he also had ambition to get his life together. And I've got to add one more important factor. Cuddy is 27. Ronnie's in his 50s. Right. Cuddy... He had a place to go. Mm -hmm. Ronnie didn't. And if you don't have a place to live, how are you going to try to get a job? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, if you're not in a treatment program, how are you going to stay off drugs without any family support? Well, we're going to keep following Cuddy and Ronnie and other men and women as they try to rebuild their lives post-prison. Thanks to Cuddy and Ronnie for taking the time to talk to us. Ear Hustle is produced by me, Erlon Woods, Nigel Poor, John Yaya Johnson, Rasan New York Thomas, Bruce Wallace, and Pat Masidi Miller. This episode was scored with music by Antoine Williams and David Jassy. Curtis Fox is our senior editor. Julie Shapiro is our executive producer for Radiotopia. Aaron Wade is our digital producer. We want to thank Warden Ron Davis. And as you know, every episode has to be approved by this guy here. This is Lieutenant Sam Robinson at San Quentin State Prison. And although it's been several months since Erlon has left San Quentin, it's nice to be able to hear his voice again and to have him still part of the process. So with that, since I still have oversight over him, since he's a part of Ear Hustle, uh, I will say I approve this episode. Next time on Ear Hustle, we're going to be talking to formerly incarcerated men and women about getting back into the game. The highs and lows of dating and romance after prison. I never thought that I'd have a gift of having that kind of love in my life. And she called me a liar, a manipulator, a con. She said because I wasn't up front. This podcast was made possible with support from the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative working to redesign the justice system by building power and opportunity for communities impacted by incarceration. Check out our website, earhustlesq.com, where you can sign up for our newsletter, see pictures of people in our stories, and it's also a place to buy Ear Hustle t-shirts and mugs. Also, follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Ear Hustle SQ. And before we go, we have another Catch a Kite episode coming up where we answer listener questions. And we're also looking for questions about life after prison. So on your phone, record a voice memo with your question. No longer than 30 seconds. And tell us your first name and where you're reaching out from. And send it to info at earhustlesq.com. Ear Hustle is a proud member of Radiotopia from PRX. 
a collection of the best podcasts around. Hear more at Radiotopia.fm. I'm Rasan New York Thomas. I'm Nigel Poor. And I'm Erlon Woods. Thank you for listening. Hello, this is a prepaid collect call from Ronnie Young, an inmate at San Joaquin County Jail. This call is subject to recording and monitoring. As we were finishing this episode, we got some news from Ronnie. We'll fill you in on that in a later episode. Radiotopia.